so uh, I guess I'd talk a little bit about uh, painting and how it works. Dogs are in here, so if you hear them, <laughs> they're, they're around. That's Marty. Wow. Marty's the light-haired one, and Demi's the dark-haired one. Yeah, you. Um, so uh, this is going to be pretty amateurish because it's, uh, well, I don't really have, like, production, so um, it's just me and my phone. And, I'm, and those of you that really know me, I'm not very good with technology, so um, bear with me. <laughs> but uh, I also fluffed up my beard today. Uh, so I'm looking real, uh, real hipster today, but, um, so I thought I'd talk a little bit about how I paint personally and, um, the way I think, um, so for example, this painting, um, I guess to start off, I, I have a generalized idea of what I want to do. Um, so I have a concept in my head. It's it's all really inspired by me and my life and the things that have happened in my life and, and the things that sort of go down. And um, so as I've said before on my Instagram, this, this, this one was inspired by my buddy, um, one of my best friends, and his sister... Um, ended up committing suicide and again I didn't want it to be about her specifically but I wanted it to be about the idea of what what that moment would be like is if you were walking by and um, you know you caught a glimpse of this person that was about to do this thing and, and what they would feel like you know as if you in one look um, were able to feel everything that they were going through you know and, you know, so that's, that's the concept is, is how do I create that? So when you think about it in those parameters, I don't, um, I don't worry about sticking to anything. This, this painting has evolved and devolved and evolved again. And, um, it doesn't have any formal structure to it. A, a lot of painters are taught to do a very you know lots of lots of studies and drawings of what they're going to do and then they lay it out very carefully and sometimes they do a grisaille which is just basically a, a monochromatic but usually gray um, background where you get all the um, values and you're you're working on all those things so and then you start glazing and it's very systematic and I, I feel like that's a very limited way to work it, it certainly works and it, it looks great in the end but um, it becomes so manufactured that it's hard to get away from it. Um, I'm very much on the, if you listen to a lot of Vincent Desiderio, who's a painter, and his videos are all over YouTube, um, he talks a lot about the sort of prison that that French Academy um, sort of creates for you when you're painting. Now, that doesn't mean it doesn't work or that it's not effective or you can't make beautiful paintings about it. Um, the painting world is, is really diverse and really big and it's a home for everybody so just because I work this way um, I don't want other people to think that other working methods aren't good for them it has to do with what you want to accomplish um, and one is not better than the other they're just different and that's cool like that's what makes it fun to go to, to museums and to look at all these different artists and painters and see what they do um, so when I think about it as a concept, I, I don't really ever feel that it's I'm stuck to one thing. So if I want to change it, I, I feel okay to change it. Um, and that's really important because that gives me the creativity to just sort of work within whatever mindset I'm in that day. And which makes it very organic and authentic to me. And... I think making work that's really important to you is what you should do. Um, because if it resonates with you, it will resonate with other people. I make work about the human condition, the things that make us human. Um, and that's really important to me. So 
if I feel something by looking at it, there's a good chance that I think other people will feel something. Um, oh man, CD skipping. We'll just turn that right off. Um, yeah, so making work that's important to you should be the number one goal. Now you try to craft it, um, and that's, that's where technique comes in, but that's a lot of trial and error. It's good to have some building blocks before you start. You know, I got my bachelor's in fine art, and then I, I moved on and got a master's degree and, and had a chance to work with a lot of painters, and that was a really important part for me. When I was younger, I worked with um, a great local painter called Mike Tanzer, and he taught me a lot about what it meant to paint, what it meant to look at things, how to use a limited palette. Um, he wasn't painting with a lot of colors when I met him. And when I worked in his studio, um, and he taught me to really work from a place that's inside of you. Don't work from pictures or photographs. Work from what other painters do. Look at other painters. And, and that's something that I've continued to do for a long time. And having studied lots of painters that I look up to, um, it seems like they look at other painters to solve problems. They don't look at a picture they don't, um, like a photograph, they're not tied to a photograph. So they work from other painters. How does a painter solve this problem? If you're looking at a hand or a you know, face or an ear, or whatever it is, look at your ear, look at what it is, look at your hands, look at other people's hands, the way light attaches to it. But also see how painters solve that problem. Um, and compare yourself to those people around you that are great. Now, everybody knows I'm, I'm not shy about the fact that I, I'm a huge Odd Nerdrum fan, and, and my work definitely reflects his, his work and his style and a lot of his philosophy, but I came to Odd kind of late. You know, I found a book when I was in my last year of undergrad, and, you know, that book really changed my life in a way because um, it made me realize that the stuff that I was working on was achievable, that people were working in this way and that there was a great living painter today that was able to make beautiful narrative paintings about the human soul. And it didn't seem as if it came from some other time. It seemed incredibly relevant today, even though it, it didn't have any of the tricks that the art world has. It, it just seemed really authentic. And, and that really pushed me to learn how to study and continue to, to paint in this way. I studied with hyper-realist painters. I studied with Mark Dennis, who had a really big influence in me. Um, I was really lucky to, to be with him when he was teaching at Elmira College. And, you know, I learned a lot from Mark. He's a really smart guy. He's a beautiful painter. And I got to see a living artist's work that was not only successful, but pushing himself. Now, I don't work anything like Mark, really. Um, I mean, I guess there's some similarities, but, you know, I really got to see a painter who was so passionate about what he does and so refined and had no didn't second guess his techniques at all um it was very confident painter and i think that's one of the things i learned from him and mike was that you know have some confidence don't be afraid to to push yourself and just say fuck it you know you know if it blows your hair back or you're willing to try it experiment be creative these are not things in painting that should be repressed um and I thought that was really helpful for me as well. Um, so I, I compare a lot and I, so um, this is Ribera. He's a, he's a great painter. And I've always had his books when I was an undergrad, even before that. Um, and I, I noticed that um, Mike Tanzer had a book of his and he kept it out every once in a while. And he would go and he'd walk over and, uh, you know, open the book up and, and frantically flip through something until he found something that he was looking for. 
and then uh, would bring the book back and put it in front of his painting and then paint it. Whatever he was working on, an arm, a finger, a face, the wrinkle in a forehead. Um, and, and, and that's what I do today. So if you can see this face, by the way, it's a face I make up. I, I don't really have a, I don't work from pictures. I don't, I work from life when I look at other people and then I sort of think about something that was interesting about their face if I meet them somewhere. Um, and then I, I go from there. Sometimes that'll stick with me and I, I think about it and I, oh, that was beautiful. Or that, that person, the way they looked, it, it, they had an impact. I wanted to look more at them. Um, but, you know, uh, the head's kind of turning, so I don't know if you can see this, but... Oh, it's bad glare. But um, this face here... Oh, shit. You'll notice that, too. My books are destroyed because I paint on them and do shit like that. Oh. Receipt. <laughs> uh, you know, I look at that as a reference. Not, not to copy that face at all. That's not what the point is. The point is to look at it as to... Here's this thing. And I can... Uh, be aware of, of, of how Ribera solved these problems of lighting or what, what his lips looked like. Um, and I find this incredibly helpful for me. I paint with lots of books around. Um, today I have out uh, Ad Nerdrum, um, El Greco. Um, what else do I have out today? Oh, Velasquez. He's, Velasquez is a genius. I mean, literally the, the like the greatest painter you know like him Rembrandt Titian Ribera um Da Vinci of course Michelangelo El Greco I mean they're just at a plateau that you just I mean I don't know how you they're just so fucking good like they're really the best um, and when you look at them, you go to the museum and you look at them, they're here in your head afterwards. Like you, you, they sort of haunt you. And my goal for my work is to always have people come and be sort of haunted by my work as if they saw it and it's here in their heads. They can't get, they can't get it out or it's something that sticks with them. Um, because that means that they had a reaction to it. You know, you paintings, unlike any other art form, art form, excuse me, um, it it doesn't have the ability to introduce more characters. It can't take any out. There's no musical score that where there's these ebbs and flows in it. Um, you know, you have the speed of light to get your point across and to make an impact on somebody. You know, you can. In a movie, you know, you can you can introduce people and kind of keep them interested and then play with them and they'll sit through that. But in a painting, you know, if they don't respond to it, they walk right by it. You know, it doesn't really mean much to them. And, you, you know, you don't make work for other people, you know, or bells and whistles. You don't, you don't make work for, for fame, like... You know, very rarely are you going to be the center of a culture, and very rarely are you going to have any sort of monetary success doing this. <laughs> but, you know, you have to be really happy with creative highs and creative lows. Um, and you have to realize that, that this process, this thing that you're doing is really hard, and it's not easy, and that the creative highs have to be the ones that sustain you. Not the monetary success, not the not the the goal of fame, because that's that's other people's reaction to what you do. So all the hard work that you put in, you know, that happens before anybody even looks at the work. I made paintings for eight years and didn't show anybody except for my friends and you know my family. You know, it's not really about that. And that was mostly because I, I just didn't feel like I had something to say that was good enough. I was working through a lot of things. So I did it just because I had to do it. And, and that's what you do. Um, 
So uh, I think what's going to happen with this painting to kind of go back is is he's sitting on a mountain here, and I've got this sort of like burning fire, um, but this sort of fire that's going out as if, you know, it's, I guess it'd be symbolic, you know, like this is, his life is coming to an end. It's, it's this, this life, this thing, this warmth is, is, is going away now. And then I think what I'm going to do is, is paint a pistol over here. And what I'll end up doing is darkening everything and, and just sort of pick out highlights where the, where the light will hit. So on his, the light's coming sort of from this direction. So I want to make sure that, that it makes sense, of course, logically, that the light seems like it is where it is. Now, one of the nice things about being a painter is, you know, you get a little artistic license to be able to, you know, fuck around with light a little bit. And it, this type of painting isn't hyper-realism, and it's not supposed to look like a photograph, and it's not supposed to be natural. That's not what this is. This isn't supposed to be exactly how it would look. It's supposed to tell a story, and, and by telling a story, you get a chance to manipulate the light to, to convey that story. Like I said, you get one chance to pull in a viewer. So, uh, how you doing, Demi? She's very excited to play today. Um, so, I think the pistol will just sort of be sitting behind him, just sort of in, uh, in that area right about there. And I think I'll probably work on that tomorrow if I get a chance. Um, I'm sort of at a weird spot right now. It's kind of really wet because I've been using a lot of oil. That's the other thing I do. I use a huge amount of oil. A lot of... I'm not one of those painters that does a lot of real... I don't know. Real thin paint. I, I use a lot of thick paint and pasto paint, which is there's thick layers of paint. And a lot of glazing and a lot of scumbling and a lot of glazing and a lot of scumbling. And then I sand a lot of that shit away. And then I start again and I change things. And, you know, it, it just sort of has to work. Because 100 years from now, nobody's going to care if that looked like anybody was supposed to or whatever. It's just got to work. The composition has to look as if he sits in space, he's created air, he's around air, as if air is wrapping around him, and that smoke feels as if it's going out, and and that face is illuminated in the right way, and, and, and that it tells the story. So all these things need to work in concert, and that's what makes this such a long, tedious process. Um, I've been working on this painting for, shit, two years now? And it it hasn't, you know, I did, it, not consistently. Um, I destroyed, I had a really nice painting under here. And I just fucking destroyed it. It just didn't work. So I kept looking at it and I couldn't get that feeling. It was, I was close to it, you know. And it felt like something to me when I'd walk in. And then I, I, I it, but it just didn't feel right. I couldn't, I couldn't figure out how to solve that problem. So I just destroyed it, and I started with an ear, and then I started again, and I changed the way the figure was sitting, and now he's cross-legged, and, you know, it's a process, and that's, that's the piece I want people to understand, is that this is a, this is a process, and I don't work on time frames, it, it just, if it takes six months, or it takes a year, or five years, it takes what it takes in order to make it feel authentic to make it feel real to me um, because that's really the only painting that really fucking matters um, so this is a really long video oh shit sorry about that <laughs> well if anybody watched it thanks